Welcome to Inspiring Teachers, a show bringing you classroom tips, motivation, and stories from successful educators. Join Tavis Beam and Danny Hogger as they explore the why of teaching. Welcome to another exciting edition of Inspiring Teachers. I'm Danny Hogger, joined by Tavis Beam. And let me tell you something, if you guys are looking for a new and engaging way to get your students up and moving in the classroom, get out of the sit and get mentality, get out of the rut, check out ampeduplearning.com. Our friends are two teachers in Texas that run this site. It's a really neat place. It gamifies teaching. There's new activities for the classroom, resources, stuff to just class up and refresh your repertoire. I like that I use repertoire. From the refresh resources and escape rooms, you gotta be careful the way you read that one. For social studies and science to seed squares and task cards for math and English, tons of resources there, guys. You can even see some Hogger History resources there. My elbow just hit the desk, that hurt. And you could use promo code HoggerHistory10 to save 10% on all items and follow them on social media at Amped Up Learning for their monthly giveaways. That's ampeduplearning.com. Thank you for supporting Inspiring Teachers. And Davis, we have an action research conference coming yeah. up next Saturday. What's it's gonna going be so on? so much fun. Yeah, we're going to be there for a couple hours doing live podcasts, doing interviews. It's going to be a blast. Absolutely. Have some giveaways. Oh, it's going to be so cool. So St. Mary's College is the place to be May 11th, 830 to 1230 at the Soda Center for the Action Research Conference. Davis and I will be there. There'll be presentations from master's students and doctoral students sharing practical and innovative research strategies. Register for free. The link is down below in the description. And now on to episode 41. What a show yeah. we've got for you guys today. <laughs> Welcome to Inspiring Teachers. <laughs> Returning to Inspiring Teachers to spread more joy, the author of the rewardingeducation.wordpress.com blog, 26-year ELA pro teacher extraordinaire, Robert Ward. Robert, how are you doing today? Great. Thanks for having me, guys. So good to be with you. Yeah, from, good to see you again. From yeah. Milford, Pennsylvania. He's a husband, father, high school principal, author, and NCAA hoops official. Gotta love that. For this man, no educational topic is out of bounds. You see what I did there? <laughs> uh, oh, Andrew oh, yeah. Morota. Andrew, Sports, how right? are you, sir? Uh, guys, I'm doing great. I'm inspired by you. Just listening to the energy tonight and, and happy to uh, be here with you. Hey, man, the ball's up in the air. We're playing basketball right now. <laughs> man, I got to tell you about the staff game we had. I was so gassed one minute of the game. Really poor. <laughs> and retired, award-winning. And oh, this guy is one of the greatest math teachers on Twitter and a youth pastor and has had quite a career in teaching. He donates his book royalties to Nana's House for Abused Children. I just love so much of what he does and shares. Ron, I've just been uh, kind of accustomed to you lately, but the messages you share are very inspiring. Thank you for joining us on our show today. So thank you so much for having me. Oh man. So guys, it's a uh, middle of a week. We're getting towards summer vacation. Tavis, why don't you kick us off and tell us like this time of year, what do you try to do to keep students focused? Why don't we start there for a second? And, and what's yeah. your mentality as a teacher to not also show that you're also looking forward to summer, which is right. kind of a secret, but <laughs> how do you manage that? And then let's ask our guests what they do. Well, I think I might tell that secret to my students that you know teachers are actually really excited for the summer as well. But I've got an added advantage being an elective teacher this year. So I can really keep my kids focused by giving them choice in what they're doing and the activities that they're partaking in. Like I had three different options I wanted to pull from. It was like, I could do this cool hands-on activity, this cool hands-on. And I realized, why don't I give them the opportunity to make that decision on their own? It wasn't that much more prep for me to just put it together. And then you know, they could uh, really have a little bit more buy-in, a little bit of choice. Sounds really great. I love choice. I love yeah. designing projects that have two or three different branches and say, hey, you could do this or this. And then when it's something they need to turn in, you have seven ways. Turn it in any yeah. way you feel like turning it into me. Be creative and expressive. Andrew, if we started with you, uh, what is something that you do this time of year or feel free to take off on the choice topic? Well, I know you guys are in California, so you might have some different weather, but it was about 40 something and, and cold and rainy here in the Northeast. So uh, they're still in school mode. Okay. Uh, All right. Yeah. Uh, but you know what? I, I think, uh, you know, we as the leaders of the building, we set the tone and uh, our energy and enthusiasm for school for learning, for being there. And sometimes when you don't even feel like it, you have to act like you feel like it, but make it the place to be, right? Make it fun. Uh, when I'm on the loudspeaker, when I'm in the halls, I'm giving high fives and the kids know that I wanna be there. And that translates to the staff and to the students. You know, We have to show that we wanna be there. Yeah. That's really impressive. My first year in high school this year, and I felt the same thing, that all the teachers cared about the well-being of their students and wanted to be there. Huge difference in the way they approach morale and the way they approach their work every day. Robert, for you, what do you do in the springtime? You're also in California, so what are you doing to help keep kids focused and on track? You know, it, every year it's so amazing to me because 
at this time, some of my students who have been so hesitant, so close, so guarded, suddenly come alive. Mm. <laughs> yeah. It's like it took them literally a semester and a half to finally trust my class, to know what was going on. I, you know, I think they enjoyed my class and liked it, but to make that leap, and probably for some of them, they've never made that leap before that they're participating. And they're saying such brilliant, intelligent, spot on things. I mean, it's, it's amazing to see. And it makes me just wish, like, I, I even joked to my, to my eighth graders this year. I said, I think I'm going to quit middle school this year and follow you guys to high school. And they're all like, yeah, yeah, follow us every year. Then you can do 10th grade. Then you can do 11th grade. Because if you don't want to live, you leave them because they, they're finally lighting up. And that really speaks to you creating a safe environment where they feel like they can. And I know that's such an important part of your work and what you talk about is creating that social emotional support for the students. So sure. bravo. And, and, and you know what it, it also is? It's not giving up. It's not writing off a kid because some mm. of the kids, I mean, even me, I would be tempted to say, I'm never getting anything from them. I can just ignore them. It's no big deal. No, it's a big deal and just wait. If you just wait one more minute, I promise you they'll surprise you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Ron, what do you say here on this? Well, with me, I'm probably a little bit weird on this. Uh, I never really end the school year. When, when my kids get close to the end of the school year, I used to teach honor to algebra and algebra geometry. And I would start linking them together with their high school teachers because I taught seventh and eighth grade mathematics. And I would link them together with the teachers that they were going to see. I'd ask those teachers, what are you expecting from these kids? Mm -hmm. And then he would start preparing in the last few weeks, making outline preparations for what they were going to actually get into so that when they got into those classes next year, it wasn't a surprise. Yeah. And they knew what they were doing, and it gave them a leg up. Mm -hmm. That was pretty exciting for the kids. They were really, they didn't want to leave school. They were just got all into it. And of course, I also taught a class which I designed called International Math. And what that was, it was like a potpourri buffet, a buffet class of mathematics. And those kids never wanted to leave. They wanted to come back during the summer and make the math projects, the models, and, the, and work on the competitions and things of that sort. Cross school year really never ended. Mm -hmm. That's really neat. Yeah. And that kind of goes to the question about processing. You know, the different ways that students like to process. So this is a very hands-on way for the students to process the lesson. And uh, you're, you're really creating an environment where they have deep meaning in what they're doing. And I think that really speaks to how students learn is finding that meaning. Mm -hmm. That's a stellar, yep. stellar segue with, with processing. I am starting my master's degree at San Diego Christian College, entering the third class, and it's time for action research. So I thought if I could explore homework for just a minute, and when you finish a lesson in a lecture, you know, I teach U.S. history and government, how often is homework appropriate? In what forms do you find that it would, like, would you, would you hypothesize that a student who's assigned homework, in my case, I'm going to do a podcast. So I record all the notes, the highlights of what I just taught. Would you hypothesize that students who go home and listen to that for 10 minutes will perform better on an assessment the next day? And I would ask, uh, Robert, I'm going to go to you first on this one. What do you think? Um, is there going to be a link in performance on assessments the following day? If they listen to your, like, review podcast? Right. And I'm thinking that as opposed to answering questions, giving a written assignment, um, would, would just a second refresher on a lecture via audio be something that might have an impact in your, in your thoughts? Um, yeah, I think that would be amazing. And as your students get used to it, then you can put them in the driver's seat and have them do, do this you know, today's podcast and that's right. Mm -hmm. have them, have them sign up in advance. Now it might be, it might not be that they can do it that day, but if, if you give them, you know, a few days advance notice and then suddenly the kids, kids are doing all the work for you. There you go. And there's, yeah. so on the Hogger History podcast, we do get the students involved. And I think you're, you've got it into a system where then everyone is keeping the machine rolling. I like that thought mm -hmm. a lot. Uh, Ron, what's your thought? You can either say on homework in general, or you can comment on, on this idea here. Well, I, I like what you guys are talking about as far as homework. And with my homework, what I would used to do is I would give them a choice. Because mathematics, usually they go home and, you know, practice 20 problems. Sure. But what if instead of practicing the 20 problems, you ask them to come up with 
my problem that kind of defines what we get. Create your own video, create your own artwork, create your own story. Something that talks about how we process the mathematics, how to make it alive and real in your life. Yeah. Now, can bring that back to the class. Wow, they've got something that's amazing because now they've internalized it and it's become part of who they are rather than something just a whole bunch of 20 questions they have to answer. Right. And this concept really paid off because my kids, I, I never say this on the post or anything, but over the 40 years that I taught, I never had a single child ever fail my class. Fantastic. <laughs> never had a discipline problem, never had a, a detention. And it's all because the kids became the motivators in the class, not just me. Yeah, they're making the meaning. They're making the purpose. That's exactly great. Andrew, you want to speak a little bit to that as well? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that topic continues to come up about homework. And, yeah. uh, you know, the, the great uh, YouTube video by Simon Sinek about why, right? Mm -hmm. He talks about mastery, yeah. autonomy, and purpose. When we were kids, you guys look a little younger than me, but when we were kids, we did the homework because the teacher told us. Mm -hmm. and, and we were yep. responsible and we were afraid of our parents and we did it, right? Yeah. It created a sense of responsibility. It created that I have to do something. Uh, later, later today, I'm responsible for something. Um, now it's a little different, right? You know, giving kids choice, giving some creativity and giving some ownership in there. You know, I think that purpose of the homework is important today versus you do it because I'm telling you to do it and there's going to be a punitive thing. Right. Um, you know, Danny, it sounds like the kids are going to listen to your podcast. One, because it's cool. Two, they could do it on their phones. And three, they probably like you. So those are all things in your favor of why they would do it. And it's certainly going to help them. I think that's a good piece. And if I could ask you a follow-up, since you have the unique view of the high school principal here, how do you see the role of homework in high school versus middle school? Because on one hand, they're preparing for college where they'll have a heavy workload. The other hand, many of them probably have jobs, are working, are balancing, are playing sports. What's your take there, just in a general standpoint, about uh, how you feel about it? Yeah, and that's a, you have a good take on that, Danny. Our best kids are the most busy kids. They do have jobs. They do, are on the sports teams. They're in the afternoon clubs. And we're trying to take care of these kids, right? Treat every kid as if they're your kid. So should there be something they're responsible for? Yes. Mm -hmm. Should it be, you know, uh, 120 minutes of homework? Absolutely not. But mm -hmm. something quick that's going to refresh what they did during the day. I like that. Yeah. And help them do better. Yeah. You know, yeah. transferring that energy. I think the podcast is a great idea. I think it's kind of like working out. You know, when you go to the gym, there's a maximum amount of time, a maximum amount of effort that you can put in before you're not going to get any return. So, you know, what I told my kids when I taught elementary school was, I'm going to give you guys these math problems. It shouldn't take you more than 20 minutes. If it takes you more than 20 minutes, stop at 20 minutes because I yeah. don't want you to spend the next hour and a half crying mm -hmm. over this assignment because I feel like, especially with mathematics, there's such emotional baggage that we give kids with math. They learn very young that they're quote unquote, bad at math because we just throw so much at them so hard. So by setting some boundaries on the amount of time and the amount of effort that they're putting into that refresher, I think it gives them a little bit more uh, space to feel free to, uh, to not complete it and to not feel like we're going to come down on them incredibly hard if they don't walk in with it 100% done. And it shows the, with the level that they're at with that assignment as well. When you grade that, it's like, okay, so in 20 minutes, they were able to do this much. So I need to support them in this way. And it goes to that quote, right? It's not the time you put in. It's what you put into the time. Yeah. So give it your all for 20 minutes, and then it'll be, it'll be a good assignment. That's a great, that's a great yeah. way to look at that, yeah. Right. I like that as well. Uh, Ron or Robert, did you have any, uh, any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to comment on the, the kids who think they're bad at math. And it wasn't because they were bad at math. They were just bad at understanding the way math was being presented to them. Mm -hmm. so figure that out, you got it. Yeah. But to go, to go back to that baggage idea, I, I really think that there, we, we have to approach, especially in the later years, math specifically from a social emotional perspective, because there is so much emotional hurt that I have had students that would rather stare at a blank page for an hour then even engage with the process and get it wrong because they're so afraid of that feeling that it's actually worse than doing nothing. So yeah. really, you know, coming at them with a soft heart and being open and understanding to that 
feeling and just acknowledging that feeling will get you a long way with a lot of kids. I've had some great successes just by really recognizing, man, you're really going through a lot with this. Look at Albert Einstein. They thought he was uh, an idiot. They, thought they gave him a broom in the sixth grade and said, you would never amount to anything. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, he became a genius. From a language arts perspective, I, um, I have kids who say, I don't like reading. Mm. So, it, you know, it's, it's the same thing. But those same kids will be the ones who, when we're reading a novel as a class, will say, no, don't stop. One more page, one more page. Oh, so you don't like reading. Yeah. It's, it's just harnessing that, that meaningful experience, that engaging experience, and then you've got them hooked. Right. And for a lot of students, I, they're probably like me, like I struggled a lot in school with reading and, and I still do. So I had a lot of emotional baggage that I had to get over when it was time to read because I knew that this was going to be a struggle for me. And I would rather just not read. But I love stories. Mm -hmm. I love books on tape. I love radio dramas. I used to listen to The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the original release of that over and over again, because I loved the story. But it was interacting with a book on my own. I just didn't have the tools necessary to enjoy it in the way that I saw so many people around me. So then I felt even worse about myself. And I'm just adding all this emotional baggage on top of me. <laughs> That's true. The only voice we have in our head is our own. And what we tell ourselves is what we're going to believe. And te teach the kids to actually question the messages that they're getting from their minds sometimes, too, because I, I don't know about you, but my mind is often wrong you know, in its analysis of the situation. So. Well, and, and Ron, you sent us the quote earlier that failure only exists in the minds of those who quit. So I Yes. Think you're leading right in. Do you know who said that? Uh, that's my quote. That's a good oh, quote. That's a great quote. <laughs> yeah, that's you got three, you have three authors on the panel. That yeah. would be a really good reference somewhere in there. <laughs> uh, let's go to that actually yeah. as a point. So all three of you have written books. And you had a way, what, a way you wanted to ask it, right? How does it affect your approach to the classroom? What was it you said before we started? Oh, well, I was thinking since all of you have written a book, how has you going through the writing process impacted the way that you are with your students. How has that changed the pedagogy? How has that changed your leadership in the classroom? That's a much question. Involved? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> when you become an author, when you try to write a book, and even when, you know, if you're writing articles or blogs, whatever, it puts you back in the, the seat and the shoes of a student because you're constantly asking yourself, well, what do I have to bring to the table? Why would anybody want to listen to me? What do I have to say? Well, probably no, there's nothing really new in education. It's, it's just what is your take on it and what can you add to the conversation and tell your personal experiences? And that's the way you make it meaningful. And when you approach writing, that way, when you approach reading that way as an interactive process and a process of sharing and, and building up that confidence, it, it really comes alive for kids. That's solid. And you know what I thought you were going to say was that when you treat each student as if their story is important, that's where the relationships come in, isn't it? And isn't that where all the joys and the togetherness and the bond comes from? I'll steal that from you. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll accept that as a reference as long as it's quoted. That sounds really fine. Uh, Ron, how about you? Well, with me, I just wanted to continue what I had been doing for the 40 years that I taught. During those years, I, I tried to change the kids' minds so that they would feel successful. I wanted them to see failures filled with opportunities for moving above and beyond. Teaching this 10-year-old boy how to change his mind and become a person who values himself, who expresses kindness, generosity, and moves on helping others and lifting others up. Right. 40 years of seeing that experience come and not a student yes. fail and all those relationships work out. It's almost like you captured photographs and memories of what a successful teacher could be. I just there want you to go. Also. So <laughs> Andrew, how about you? Yeah, no, the whole, the whole thing's been a great journey for me. Uh, I had a chance to talk with the great uh, sports author, John Feinstein, who wrote a number of sports books, but probably most famously, you know, A Season on a Brink. Uh, talking following Indiana basketball uh, with Bobby Knight. But Feinstein said, write about things that you know about. And being a principal, I've been a principal for uh, 14 years and, and going through the hard times, the good times, 
um, it kind of came easy. And I did a multitude of, of writing. I did, uh, you know, typing on the computer. I did talk to text while I was walking. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, different things like that. Um, and, and my kids loved it. My students loved it. Um, you know, I'll show the cover of the book like uh, Ron did. There you go. <laughs> the kids, even the kids in the hallway were like, Mr. Morata, I'm on the cover of your book, you know? And, <laughs> oh, and they were no. up about that. So the whole thing was really cool. Um, but when you know what you're talking about, if you have experience, it kind of just, it kind of just flows, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and I feel like going through that writing process, kind of speaking to what and I believe everybody has said that we, kind of, we flush out our ideas, we relearn everything, we become that learner again. And uh, it, it's really through that writing process that I, I've never written a book, but I, I feel like I really solidify what it is that I think. Uh, it's almost like a um, recursive or a biofeedback kind of system where you're putting your ideas down and you're reprocessing, you're relearning everything again. And I think it just, it, it, it helps guide me when I take that time to sit down and write an idea down. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Things get easy, wonderful when you, oh, sorry, that wasn't as good. I should have done it after no, I no, talked because no. you said something serious. Um, yeah, it's true. It, it is. You're, you're in tune with who you are and you're very conscious of like where your thoughts are coming from. And I like moments like that when you can be honest and transparent with your classroom because they can see, one, it's okay to be vulnerable with them, speak your thoughts out loud. And I don't mind telling them that I'm still forming opinions on things and still learning about history because nobody could be such an expert on history that they know everything. There's always more to learn. So those are all valuable, valuable things. We've got just enough time for one more thing. And maybe each of you might share with us, you're, you're all such inspiring teachers on Twitter. Make sure you give your handles out before, as you answer this question, but what's a, a piece of advice you'd like to share with teachers who are watching this right now? Teachers who are gonna watch this in the weeks to come. What's something you would like to say to all of them if it was like a little mini professional development and you were chosen as the speaker? What's something you would say? Let the ringing happen and, you know, answer the call of life. And, and Andrew, we'll start with you. Yeah, and that's a great question. Um, I'd love to connect with people on Twitter if I could help them in any way. Uh, I am at Andrew Murata 21 and I'm a high school principal here in New York, and, and I love it. So um, what I would say to teachers at this time of the year, number one, you were talking about things that we do to keep the kids uh, invested and, and, and still into school, right? And what's the best way to keep the kids uh, focused and, and knowing that school's not over is to have the adults act and know that school's not over, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I wrote down a couple of quotes. You could be the smartest person in the room, but it, it, but if they're not digging you, if you're not connecting with kids, if you don't know that that kid uh, struck out at the plate in the last inning of the game last night, he's probably not going to be in your lesson. So one of the things, it's, it's not the information, it's the inspiration. Uh, Danny, you and I just met uh, your kids, and my guess is that they probably love you, not because you know a lot about history, but because That's- you're into that <laughs> enthusiastic, and, and, you know, it's not, it's not the content, it's, it's the inspiration, it's the mm. enthusiasm, um, and you got to bring it each and every day. That's true. Right. That's true. The other thing I would tell the teachers, you know, there's so much I need professional development, you need a certification, you need this, you need that, forget it try things. My brother's a big time chemist with Estee Lauder. And he, I interviewed him once on my podcast. um, And he said, we do the try method. We try this, we try that. And we try it until we create something that people want. And I was like, God, man, I wish (laughs) teachers thought like that. That's great, right? So it's not the amount of times that you fail that counts. It's the amount of times you succeed. So Mm. trying to do that and make an awesome lesson. Try something different. Whether it's the Google uh, EDU breakout boxes, uh, doing podcasts, doing different things, uh, you know, creating prezies, whatever it is, don't be afraid to screw it up. Because right. if you do strike gold that one time, those kids are going to remember that forever. Well, it wasn't Edison and his team. It was over, something like over 2,000 different types of filament that they tried before they got the one that worked. Mm-hmm. And if they had given up on that, you know, 1,999, it wouldn't have the light. Well, somebody probably figured it out eventually, but it wouldn't have been attributed to that particular group of people. So and in my classroom, in the wood shop, in my maker space, failure is always an option. You know, it, it's, it's okay to make mistakes. We learn from them. We keep going. Very true. Yeah. Very true. Ron, your thoughts for this week? Andrew, thanks. Those are great. Ron, what do you have for us? 
if you expect success, you'll never stop working until you get it. So encourage, inspire, empower, invest in uplifting words, information, expecting defeat, and expect success. Well, E-I-E-I-O, Old McDonald would be proud. We both have toddlers, so I can't help but just start singing that in my head. We've been hearing that. I'm a big fan of the Row, Row, Row Your Boat Club as well. Life For is sure. but a dream. You know? For sure. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, uh, Robert, can you uh, go ahead and speak a little bit about, you know, what, 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 your, what are your uh, parting thoughts on all of this? Well, yes, because Andrew's talking about, you know, a word, trying. And Ron's talking about a word, expectation, e expecting. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's just one word that switches your mindset. So I, I recently wrote a pretty popular article. We, uh, we know about the growth mindset and the power of the word yet. Mm -hmm. that sure. I, I'm working on my math skills. I, I haven't gotten there yet, but I'm, I'm, it's, it's a process and a journey. But if we use the word get, Instead of saying, I have to do this, oh, I have to go to class, I have to teach today, I have to face the traffic today, if we use the word get, it changes your whole perspective. So instead of, oh gosh, I have to teach today, I get to teach today, and I get to interact with and inspire 150 eighth graders and help them grow socially, emotionally, soulfully, and academically. It changes the whole mindset with one word, I get to. And if, if, if you approach teaching and life as a generosity and a gift, you've got it made. That's yeah. really nice. And I hadn't heard that one before. And, and when, it's kind of to wrap all these up if I want to add yeah. on top of that. Um, for me, when you've got that intention set, I, I, what I, one thing I remind myself when I'm starting to feel myself slow down and get into that negative mindset is I, just, I am the arrow sprung from the bow. I have the intention, it's already been let go, and I've just got to fulfill what's already in motion, at this point in the year, especially when we're so close, then we can just feel that target right there. But to really be mindful in each moment, to not get stuck by thinking about something else that I'd rather be doing, or, or what I'm not doing right all the time, and those cyclical thoughts we can have that kind of bring us down is that no I'm just I'm the arrow sprung from the bow I'm gonna continue going yeah you know what it's like the whole theme of today if your first ball doesn't knock down all the pins you can always hit the spare you know, I didn't know we were a prop video. comic no but now I feel like well. this is the only thing I want to do now. um guys I did that already in my career <laughs> thank you so much for joining us today Andrew I really appreciate the advice the feedback from a high school perspective we hope you'll join us again sometime soon yeah, let's do it, man. We'll have to come out to California. Oh, man, Definitely. let's do it. We'll be glad to host you. We got an extra guest bedroom right back here. Uh, Ron, thank you so much for the inspiration and the generosity and for giving so much advice to so many people. We appreciate you. Thank you. And Robert, man, we appreciate you joining us back again, being our returning guest, our veteran on the court. We appreciate your leadership and all your teaching through the week. Always a pleasure, guys. Thank you. Oh, thank wow. you. Well, thank you so much. For Tavis Beam and myself, we'll see you May 11th at St. Mary's. And don't forget AmpedUpLearning.com using the code HoggerHistory10. For now, class is dismissed. We will see you guys on the next edition. Have a wonderful day, and we will see you next time. Thank you.